and my title for tonight is then I passed by that I, I can see my notes are lacking an N but then I passed by so uh, we're going to read from uh, uh, three porch, uh, uh, three different passages of scriptures and I would like to start in Leviticus Leviticus which is the priest book in the Torah law, the Jewish Torah law, the third book in our Bible. And we read like this from chapter 17 and verse 11. The blood brings atonement for one's life is what I want you to see here. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And we know that this was all uh, pointing towards what would happen when Jesus Christ, our Savior, entered the world. Amen. And we're going to continue to read from Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, and it, 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 it says like this from verse 4. On the day that you were born, this is uh, God speaking to Israel. On the day you were born, but how many of you know that when God speaks to Israel, you can be included? Because you've been a, as a wild olive branch grafted in to the olive tree that is Israel. And it says here, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in clothes. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out in the open field. <laughs> for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by. Can everybody say that? Then I passed by. And it says, I saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood I said to you live and uh, when I've been praying this afternoon and this entire day for this meeting tonight I've seen the Lord walk through Griffin I've seen the Lord Jesus Christ walk through Atlanta and he is looking to people that have not been cared for by anyone so I want to say to you if you grew up an orphan if there were, if 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 if, if, if if you are an unwished child, are you hearing me? If, if you were thrown out the open field in just a puddle of blood with not even your cord cut, the Lord is still walking by your puddle. The, the Lord is still coming to your field. And He takes pity on you and He loves you and He cares for you. And that's why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. Praise God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were not abandoned. We were not left to die in the open field. But the Lord came by. And I speak this with so much passion because I am the son of an alcoholic mom, of a gangster dad. And I was abandoned as a child. And, and, and I had to move and move and move between different homes but uh, hallelujah, when I was 20 years old, the Lord passed by my field. He passed by my field. He saw me kicking about in my blood. And he said, you are going to live. And tonight he says to so many of you, you are, you are not going to die. You are going to live. Uh, you are mine. I will adopt you into my family. And it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. And if you are in church for the first time in your life, listen now. The Lord is passing your field tonight. The Lord is coming to your blood puddle. And he says, you are going to live. I love the gospel because it's hope for everyone. It's hope for prostitutes. It's hope for crack addicts. Are you here? It's hope for everyone. It's hope for beggars. It's hope for kings. It's hope for everyone in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul describes our salvation and he says that he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It is God's pleasure and it is God's will for you to be adopted. 
adopted into the family of God. So I don't care who you are tonight, if you call yourself an atheist or an agnostic or a Hindu or a Muslim. I know the Lord is not going to pass by your field. He's not going to look the other direction. He will stop at your blood puddle and he will say you are going to live. And he will adopt you into his family. Can you say amen? You're part of his family if you want tonight. Please be seated in the name of Jesus. Tonight I want to say something about this blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. I cannot leave Georgia without preaching about the blood. Uh, I have to say something about the blood. And uh, I want to do it with a lot of scriptures. Acts 20, 28 says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And this is to the pastors and the staff here at Griffin. Uh, be shepherds of the church of God. Isn't this fantastic that the church doesn't belong to any man? It doesn't belong to any pastor, to any minister, to any priest. And I want you to know this, that when you are giving your life to Jesus, you're not giving yourself to a pastor. You're giving yourself to Jesus. You're coming to Jesus. And it says here that we should keep watch and be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Amen. He bought you. You don't belong to the devil. Are you hearing me tonight? You don't belong to demons. You don't belong to depression. You don't belong to sickness. You are bought with a price. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. How many of you are happy that you were redeemed? I am just so happy I could stop preaching right now and start dancing. <laughs> just, oh, hallelujah. Because I feel I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins we received in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Can you shout amen? amen. All right. Um, in Africa we always say, and I think I mentioned it here, that you know, um, people say sometimes, if there was so much power in the blood of Jesus and such a redemptive power in the blood of Jesus, why is the world not looking better than it is? It's been there for 2,000 years. Why are there still civil war going on, genocides going on? Why is there still depression and suicide and addictions? And why is there so much tension and strife in the world? That's wonderful. Amen. So, listen up. We always say in Africa that, that uh, it's the same with soap. There's a lot of soap in the world, but still there are people dirty. So you can't say, you know, just because the blood has been poured out 2,000 years ago and Christianity, uh, ha, ha, you know, has not been accepted anywhere. And by the way, I don't believe in a Christianity or a religion. I believe in something far greater than that. But I want you to get hold of this. You cannot say and you cannot blame God. God has come. God sent his son. God came down in human flesh to care for us. He came to everyone's field and everyone's puddle. So, thank you brother. So I want you to get this now. That... Uh, there's a lot of soap in this world, but still we got people dirty. Because soap doesn't just work because you look at it. Not even if you buy it. You got to apply it. Apply it to your body with water. You got to rub that soap towards your body. And I say the same to people out there that are saying, why is God not helping me? Well, have you humbled yourself? Have you surrendered? Have you come and have you understood that you need forgiveness and cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the blood, you know, and the soap for this world. Are you hearing me? It's the strongest shampoo, strongest soap that we can ever get. Okay, with this simple analogy, I want to continue. And I want to say that in Hebrews chapter 9, it says like this, that there was a heavenly tabernacle. They had one among the people of Israel, right, that they carried with them in the desert. And only the high priest could go in. It was the same with the temple. 
Only the high priest could go in once a year with the atonement blood, with the blood uh, to, to, to pray for the people, ask for forgiveness of their sins. But when Jesus died, he went into the heavenly tabernacle. And it says in, in Hebrews chapter, four, uh, chapter 9 and verse 14 that, that if we were once cleansed by, by this blood in the temple and uh, by ashes from a heifer and so on, there are different rituals. How much more than will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And I'm here to testify tonight that I uh, came to Jesus filthy as filthy can be, as dirty as dirty can be. And my conscience was burned, like the Bible says, with a hot iron. I didn't feel, I was numb. But uh, and if you don't know anything about how sin can numb you, let me tell you, sin can numb you to the point where you don't feel a thing anymore. But when I came to that blood, my conscience, my, my, my inner life started to get weaker and weaker and softer and softer. Not in a bad sense, not in a bad way, but he... He opened up my heart and all of a sudden I could feel again. And I could become sensitive again. And how I wish that each and every one of you could experience the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that way. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, it says that it's only the shedding of blood that forgives sins. Well, in fact, the law requires, it says, that nearly everyth everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And some people don't really understand why this is. Well, I have to take you to some things tonight that are, you know, just from, just from science. I got to, you know, I, some of you know it, but I'm married to a doctor, right? And it's not always easy to be married to a doctor. I don't go into any very big intellectual arguments with her because I always lose. Uh, I'm the preacher of the family and she's the doctor of the family and, and uh, she's super smart and I called her on the phone this afternoon to make sure I'm telling you the truth here tonight, right? So the blood and its function, I want you to get this, a human blood and its function has basically, um, I mean there are basically three reasons for us to have the blood pumping through our bodies, are you with me? The first one is this, it brings and transports oxygen and nutrition to all of our tissues. Do you agree with me if you're a nurse or a doctor? It, it, the blood has that function, it transports oxygen and nutrition to all of us. And I want you to get hold of this now, I, 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 I really want all of you to get hold of this. It's the same with the blood of the Father. We know from scientists and we know that... Uh, the blood group that you have and the blood you have comes from the Father. And it was the same when God sended His Son. Well, He was born by a woman. He was bo born by a simple human being here on earth. But the blood He had straight from the Father. And, um, and I want you to get hold of this. The second function of blood is that it forms blood clots that prevents blood loss, Right? We could say that blood is self-healing because it, 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 it clots up and it hinders us from losing the blood. And it, 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 it heals our body somewhat and protects our bodies. And I want you to get hold of this also. The number third function of blood is it fights infections through white blood cells. And when I've been looking Upon this, you know, when you have an infection and, 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 and your blood starts to produce all these, blood white, uh, all these white blood cells and starts to fight the infection, it is the same with the blood of Jesus. Are you here? Without the blood of Jesus, there is no life flowing in the church. Without the blood of Jesus, there's no life in your life. It is the oxygen and it is the nutrition to your life. 
That's why we always speak about the blood of Jesus being the biggest blood transfusion that has ever happened to mankind. How many of you know that blood can be bad? If I say there is bad blood, that can mean different things to you. But there is bad blood in this world. And sometimes there needs to be a big transfusion of blood. We need to receive some healthy blood for the, blood, for the bad blood to get sound again. And I'm not trying to lecture you here on a medical uh, field. I'm just here to tell you that without the blood of Jesus, there is no real life for any one of us. And without the blood of Jesus, there is not <laughs> anything that can heal us. Because the blood of Jesus heals. And without the blood of Jesus, we wouldn't be protected. And, 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 and some of you say, why, why, why are you going into all these things? Well, I want you to get this now. In the blood of Jesus Christ, there is life, there is healing, and here's the number third. It fights the devil and infections and attacks. It's so wonderful with the blood of Jesus that it fights for itself. With or without our participation, it fights. When you get sick, when you get infected, you don't have to do anything. The blood starts to produce white blood cells and starts to fight that infection. When you get caught, you don't have to do anything because if your blood is sound, if it's the way it's supposed to be, it will cloth up and it will heal. And I'd like to say this here tonight that the blood of Jesus Christ fight the devil, fight the de fights the devil for you right now. Even you that have not received the redemption and the forgiveness, even for you, the blood of Jesus is a fighter. We always say in Africa that, you know, we take this example of the woman that walks home <laughs> from a festival. She's heard the gospel. She has received Jesus Christ. She has been marked with the blood. How many of you know that the priests in the Old Testament, they were marked by the earlobes, by the thumbs, by the big toes. They were marked for ministry. And when you've come to Jesus and you've surrendered to Jesus and you have given your life to Jesus, you're marked. You're marked by a blood that is the very life for you, that is your healing, that fights for you. And uh, we always tell this story about the woman that walks home. She is now marked in the blood of Jesus. And there are three demons sitting on a fence. <laughs> How many of you heard the story? I love the story. Three demons. There's an older demon, very experienced, very scarred. He's been fighting righteous people for a very long time. And then there are two younger demons. Just follow me. It's a little bit of a story. And the two younger demons see this happy woman singing gospel songs, walking home from our gospel festival. And they say, let's go get her. Let's go attack her right now. Let's go and land upon her like two bats and whisper into her ears, sit on her shoulders and, you know, just torment her. When they are just about to take off like two little dragons, there is the older demon screaming, don't do it. And he grabs one by the wing and the other one by the claw and he holds them back. And he says, don't do it. Can't you see? She is marked with the blood of Jesus Christ. If you attack that woman, everything you attack her with will boomerang right back at you. If you attack that woman now, you will have hell breaking loose. And I'm here to tell you that when you have marked yourself by surrendering to Jesus Christ, coming to Jesus Christ, there's no demon in hell that doesn't see that you are marked. You are marked by the blood of Jesus and you are protected. There's life there. There's more than life there. There's healing there. There's protection there. And the blood fights. The blood fights. And we always, when we have Lord's Communion in Africa, we always declare together, and I wish we could do it here in America too. We always declare together when we have the Lord's Communion. We say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. 
We say, Satan, you cannot pass this blood. Is that too radical for America or is that good for America? We always say, Satan, listen to me. This blood of Jesus Christ is against you. It fights you on my behalf. When you go to sleep, you don't have to do spiritual warfare and prayer all the night through. You can sleep tight uh, and you can sleep nice and you can sleep in peace like a little baby. Hallelujah. Because you are protected. You are marked. And the blood fights. We always declare that. We, 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 we address the devil like that. We say you cannot touch this church. You cannot touch our marriages. You cannot touch our children. You cannot touch our health because the blood of Jesus Christ is against you. Wow, if we could start to declare like that in America, what would you say? If we, would, if we could plead the blood of Jesus like that and declare the blood of Jesus. And in Africa we believed, we believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is going to wash our continent in the blood of Jesus Christ. We will get rid of poverty and genocide. We will get rid of witchcraft. Are you hearing me? And unpolitical rest. And you need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over America and over Georgia and over Atlanta. And you need to scream out, Satan, this blood is against you. There's something so powerful with the blood of Jesus Christ. First Peter says that, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And I just have to stop there before I continue to read verse 19. Because didn't we receive an empty life? Okay, some of you don't know where I'm going with this, but grandfather, uncles, my dad... My cousins, everyone that was older than me, they handed down a life to me that was super empty. Oh yeah. When I was 11, I think I'd seen everything that there is to see. And when I was 16, I got suicidal. What the heck is this life about? Slaving away, making a little vacation. Huh? Cut the lemon a little bit differently for the drink. Put a new little parasol or umbrella in the drink. Oh, we're having such a fun time. When I had hugged a girl for the first time and I'd been drunk a few times and, and you know, I'd been at a beach one time in Italy, I thought, okay, so this is all. Some of you don't like when I go this way because you say this is a too depressive way of viewing life. But I can just tell you, at age 16, I said to my dad, is this all? And then I dragged myself for another four years before I experienced what life is really about. Real life came with Jesus. Real healing and fulfillment and satisfaction came with Jesus. Stuff. Oh, we can buy a better car. We can buy a better house. Wow. Fantastic. Wow. But you just hear it, my wow, how empty it is. Let's go for a career. Let's make something out of our lives. And before you know it, you're middle-aged. Life is passing away. Are you here? Before you know it, you're old and gray. And what now? What now? So forgive me for saying it. But I'm saying it with boldness tonight. This life handed down by our ancestors. It was a very empty way of living. But we... We're not bought with perishable things such as silver or gold. But with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. And when I gave my life to Jesus and surrendered to Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that's when life started. When my arm was hooked up to the blood transfusion from heaven. When that blood of Jesus Christ came and redeemed the bad blood in my family. When the blood of Jesus came and took revenge away and gave love instead. Hallelujah. 
took anxiety away and gave peace instead. Colossians tells us this so beautifully. I think it is in Colossians 1, right, that, that uh, he brought peace through the blood of Jesus Christ. Peace that could not be gained any other way. And I'd like to, to just get this through to each and every one of you because I've not come to Georgia to make you followers of Johannes or make you followers of Pastor Ron. I've come to Georgia to preach about something that is bigger than a pastor, bigger than an evangelist, bigger than a missionary, bigger than a church, bigger than a denomination, bigger than a theology. I come to Georgia to declare that there's life in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's healing in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is redemption in the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 John, I love this little verse. 1 John, the first epistle of John, the first letter of John. Chapter 1 verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light. And every time we take the Lord's communion in church, it is like we're being hooked up to a lie detector test. The light of Jesus exposes everything when we come into his presence. But the beautiful thing about being in his light is that we are not condemned in that light. He takes pity on us. He stops by our blood puddle. He stops by our bad blood. And I love that it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. There's no nonsense when you come into the presence of Jesus. You don't fight about these little ridiculous things anymore. The, the tone of your skin color is irrelevant when you come into the light of Jesus. You don't fight about little things that has to do with politics. Because we got something that is higher than politics. We don't fight about different words and, you know, uh, different, uh, how should I say, interpretation of scriptures anymore. Because we know what it's all about. When we are in the light of Jesus Christ, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship. We cry. We cry tears. We hug each other. And it says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin. Where does the blood of Jesus purify us? When we are in the light, when we are exposed, when we have to surrender. In Africa, we see it by the thousands. This year, we're standing in faith for 500,000 new Jesus disciples in churches after our festival season. We're not talking about cards of decisions or hands in the air. We're talking about people discipled. And every year when we go on our conquests on our you know <laughs> uh, festival tour we rally up thousands of churches in every place and uh, we do it for one reason we know the blood is going to come like a river through that town and you should see an African town after we've preached the gospel for a week we've blasted the gospel to hundreds of thousands on that Monday morning you can you can feel the peace just hovering over the streets. Crime goes down. Rape statistics goes down. Because there's something that the blood of Jesus can do that no court can do. That no prison can do. There's something that the blood of Jesus can do that no psychiatrist or doctor can do. There's something about blasting the gospel and the blood power in, in a city or a town. Sometimes I just want to stay back for a day or two and just walk around town. Everywhere I go, I meet people. They run out from their stores. They want to run out from the restaurants. My mama was saved in your festival. My sister was healed. She was blind. She can see. And they cry and they come. The prostitutes come because they have now left the whorehouse and the pimp. Huh? The street boys, I can't, can't ever forget when I rolled out of town in a city in the DRC, Congo. And there was this street boy running up 17 years old just banging my window. And I thought he was going to beg from me, but no. I rolled down my window and he said, are you the evangelist? 
I said, I am. And he said, I will remember you forever. And then he started sobbing. I've lived in the streets outside of the soccer stadium. And now I've heard you every night. And I've taken careful notes of your sermons because I'm going to preach them better than you. <laughs> My life is transformed. My life is changed. Man, I sobbed the whole way to the airport. Couldn't talk to my co-workers in the car because a 17-year-old street boy had rattled my world because he had experienced the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you're sitting here tonight, that power is making its way to you. It's on your skin as you are listening to me. It enters into your bone as you are hearing my voice. The anointing and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is carried by my voice right in to your sicknesses. The white blood cells of the blood of Jesus is fighting your infections right now. The oxygen and the nutrition that is within the blood of Jesus just is being pumped into your body as you hear this message. Whatever it is that needs to be healed, the blood can heal. There's something so powerful with the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, we always take this picture. Let me do it here too. I don't think I've told it even though we've had 30 meetings. I, I thought I would run out of sermons, but there's a deep well. Uh, the Bible has 66 books and there it's just fantastic to, to dig into it. But I read once upon a time, and I'm going to take an American picture here, when they started building all the skyscrapers on Manhattan in New York City. And there was one little landlord, one little shack <laughs> in the middle of all the skyscrapers. He wouldn't give it up. He wouldn't sell. He wanted to live there. <laughs> Finally, I mean, they came with offer after offer to him. It was fantasy money offered to him so <laughs> he signed he was going to sell and he thought because they gave him a, what do you call it in English a down payment right they gave him a, a little bit of money <laughs> and uh, he thought I better renovate the house before they take it over so he fixed up his whole house, used the whole down payment because he was thinking, I'm going to get so much more money. He painted that house. He worked on that house. And he was so proud when he stood. I've seen the picture. It's, a, it's an awesome story. He stands in a white shirt and a vest, so proud to hand over the keys. And then the guy who bought it, he, he felt, I shouldn't break this to him, but finally he returned from his car and said, my friend, I just have to tell you that I was never interested in your house. Ne already next week, there will be a bulldozer coming in here, leveling your house to the ground because we were interested in your property. And there's going to be another skyscraper coming up right here. When I read that story, I, I had to think about what it is to become a new creation in Jesus Christ. So many of us try to renovate our houses to fit in church. We paint ourselves so well before we go to church. Huh? Women do their makeup and you put your balm on your head or whatever you do, you guys. And are you hearing me? And we're trying to act like you know, holy believers. We've got to speak the right way, dress the right way, act the right way, right? <laughs> I just have to laugh about religion because religion is the same all over the world. There's a certain code that you have to keep yourself to. If you break the code, there's just something in the air. You don't know what it is, but uh, you know something is wrong. 
Pharisees and Sadducees are the same all over the world ever since the days of Jesus. Hypocrisy on the outside. Renovation. But I want to declare here tonight and I want to blast it. God is not into any renovation business. He's interested in your property. He's interested in your ground. Because he's going to build something brand new when you come to Jesus Christ. He will level all the old. So don't you ask God to renovate your old jack. Come to Jesus. Give it up. Surrender to Jesus. And the house will be leveled to the ground and the new is built. <laughs> My relatives once got so mad with me when I talked things they couldn't understand down in Austria. I was quoting the Bible, this and that. And they said, don't you remember where you come from? Don't you remember who you are? Don't you remember we are Amritsers? We are this, we're that. Huh? We are losers. We divorce. We die in cancer. This is it. This is that. This is. Don't you know where you come from? I said, sorry, but uh, there's a brand new house in front of you. I'm sorry to say, but there's a new family tree. And it started with me when Jesus came into my life. Sorry to say, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is not interested in renovating your religious facades. Painting and fixing up your self-efforts of righteousness. He rips it apart. He sends in a big bulldozer. There are some angels driving it. And then he builds something brand new out of your life. See, I am making everything new, it says in Revelations. When the blood of Jesus comes, it cleanses the very ground. All the trash is being brought to one side and the blood of Jesus cleanses everything. How many of you know that if you want to build something on an old foundation, you first have to get the dirt away? Right? You can't just build if it's dust and dirt and trash there. You've got to cleanse that foundation. Hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus is that cleansing factor. He sprays off the concrete. Are you here? He comes in and just blows it off with the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he builds something brand new in your life. And listen to me, men and women of Griffin and Georgia. Jesus is here tonight in this room. Walking from field to field. From blood puddle to blood. And he's not going to pass you by. When you scream, when you cry out, he stoops down to adopt you. He stoops down to wash you and cleanse you and wrap you. He stoops down to multiply you. Yeah. I couldn't even just hear the Holy Spirit on my inside. Tonight I feel like I want to prophesy over each and every one of you. Nothing that you've accomplished for the Lord counts tomorrow. Nothing that you've done, you know, you can rely on now. He makes everything new. Every day there is new grace. Every day there is new manna falling out of the sky. Every day you have to surrender and obey his commands and walk with him. The Lord is about to do something brand new here at Griffin First. He's blowing the old away with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's ready to do something brand new with each and every one of you. It will happen in your family. It will happen in your marriage. It will happen in each and everyone's individual life. The blood of Jesus is here. In the spirit I see a river coming through Griffin. A river with thick, healthy blood from the farmer. I see the wounds of Jesus open and blood is just gushing out, pumping out. 
for your redemption, for your salvation, for your new beginning. Some say we can't preach about the blood because it's so graphic. Huh? Even when that movie was made, right? What is it called again? Passion of the Christ. Too graphic. What did Mel Gibson think? Why did he do it so graphic? Because it is graphic. The gospel is raw and brutal. The gospel comes right at you and in your life. There's nothing religious about the gospel. The gospel knows what you smell like. Knows every, every filthy thing you've done. When that light shines, you just stand there naked in the light. And at the same time, the grace reaches you and the blood of Jesus cleanses you and a new beginning starts. I feel sorry for so many people when I'm in America. I gotta be honest. I love you guys with all of my heart. You are amazing. But there is so much religion. And that's why the youth are running away. This is an amazing gospel, an amazing message. But it's got nothing to do with codes. Are you here? And, and, and how to act and how to be. When the blood of Jesus comes, you know when you have a disciple in front of you. So... I will end here very soon by praying for all of you. And I believe the healing is going to flow in this room tonight. And I believe salvation is going to come to you like a flood tonight. And I believe there is no demon that can stand this message tonight. The claws are coming out of your skin as I speak. The chains are breaking as I speak. There's nothing that can hold you when that blood stream comes. When we're going to pray, it's going to be fantastic. Jesus is going to stand right here in this room. Touch people. Pour his shampoo and soap and cleansing tools upon you. Well, um, let me end by telling a little story from, uh, <laughs> from my own family. I had this family member that Always was listening when I preached the gospel. He was always very humble and open, but I could just see in his eyes that there was something, you know, he always lit up when I told the gospel, but there was something that was troubling him. And finally, I went on this car ride with him, dear uncle of mine, and he told me that, you know, I murdered once and I got away with it. My friends took the blame and, and then I've done this and I've done that and then he just broke. Do you really believe there is hope for me? So his problem was not the gospel. It was not the blood of Jesus Christ. It was not the cross. It was not the death and the resurrection. No, his problem was, am I good enough for this? Is there a chance for a sinner like me. And how many aren't we that are trapped in that devil's thought pattern? Thinking we're not good enough. Kept in condemnation. Kept in guilt. Kept in bondage by the devil. And that was the absolute same for me. I could say, and I know many that are first generation believers in here could say the same. Well, the Christian message sounded wonderful, but, but then it was me. Could I fit there? Among all these, so holy, so perfect. And my uncle just cried out when I started preaching to him about the cleansing blood of Jesus and that he makes everything new and that he's not into the renovation business and that he can forgive every filth. I never forget how he threw himself over the dashboard of the car. I was driving and sobbed and screamed. One time, 
I'm going to tell the story to them. We're going to pray. There was this mafia hood that reached out to me. Yeah, they were the Balkan mafia, the Serbish people. And uh, <laughs> he said, we have a guy that I've just come out from jail. He is 67 and he wants to leave the family. And we have decided he is going to have a pass so he can go. But he wants to meet a priest. As, so they asked, are you up for the task? Are you up for it? I said, yes, of course. I took a collar on that day as a safety precaution. Because with a collar on in the ghetto, you can survive. And I went up to these Serbs, bodyguards, weapons everywhere. And I met with this guy who had been, you know, been in money laundering and prostitution and gun trades and killed and raped. And, and he told me his story. For an hour I listened to things because he wanted to make his confession. For an hour I listened to things I didn't want to hear. And then he said, is there hope for me? And we bowed our knees at the couch in the middle of all these bodyguards. And when we bowed our knees and I said, say after me, I am a murderer. He looked around and everyone looked around like, what is this priest saying? I said, say and confess it. I am a murderer. He said, I am a murderer. I am a rapist. And I went on and I went on and I went on with a long confession. Until everyone in the room was sobbing. And then I'm telling you, a light filled that whole room. The devil had to run. The presence of God came like a flood. And the blood of Jesus started washing this man. He threw himself on the couch, screamed. The demons left him. The, the blood of Jesus cleansed him. On that Sunday, he sat on the first row in our church. Shining like a sun. 67 years of hell was just buried in the blood of Jesus Christ. 50 years of abuse, of murder, of rape, of stealing, of filth was buried in the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, he worshipped that day. Because you don't have to teach someone how to worship. When the chains have been cut off. He needs no worship seminars. If you want real worship. Pack your church out with sinners that have been cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't worship lame. Like people who take it for granted. They worship with everything they have. Because they have experienced the blood of Jesus Christ. There are so many lame worshippers. Second, third, fourth generation believers. That are taking this blood for granted. Griffin, don't take this blood for granted. Each and every one of you I'm charging you today. There is a blood that has been paid for your life. There is someone that sweated, bleeded, and died on the cross for you to worship with everything you got. Don't give me all those lame excuses. It's not my personality. It's not how I was raised. Do you think I was raised like that? I was raised at a beer party. I was raised with drugs on the table. You just need to mention the name of Jesus to me and I get all soft hearted. If you put on a worship song, I will worship with you. Real salvation comes when we render our lives and surrender our lives in the light of Jesus Christ.
We don't need more religion. How many of you agree with me? To hell with religion. Come on somebody. Get out of my way religion. You're just making people immune. You just turn the youths and the next generation off. Out of the way religion. We don't need people sitting like this in church wondering if the pastor is going to say something that is worth an amen or a hallelujah. We don't need people that are looking down on everyone else because they are not dressed right. The sh skirt is too short. What the heck is wrong with you? You don't even have eyes for that if you've met with Jesus Christ. You wouldn't even see it if you've met with Jesus Christ. You're worshiping Jesus. You don't look around at the girls with a short skirt. You have eyes for Jesus. Religion is a killer. An opium to the people. But the blood of Jesus Christ makes everything new. Man, I'm here to preach to you tonight. This last service that we are having together, the blood of Jesus will ring in your ears. The blood of Jesus will follow you to your home. When they refused Jesus, you know, when they refused Jesus, the blood came upon them in another way. When they accepted Jesus, the blood cleansed and made everything new. The holiest thing that we have in our Christian faith is the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, right now before we start to pray, I see Jesus again. And Ashley has been asking me to tell the story and I don't know if I should, but there was an old violinist. That wanted to buy a new violin. He was super famous in South Europe. That's where I was born in South Europe. Everyone knows the story. They had records. He was playing for kings and royalties. And now he wanted a new violin. So he went to one of the famous stores in Vienna, Austria. He checked out every violin in the store. He didn't like it. Finally, he needed to go pee. Come on, somebody. He was in his 70s and, you know. So they said, go through the workshop. And out in the backyard, there is an outhouse. And he walk, walks through the workshop and out into the backyard. And there's this outhouse. And next to the outhouse is an ash heap. But they burned the trash. You don't do that in America anymore, do you? But you do some places, huh? But in South Europe and in Africa, we got the ash heaps everywhere. During the night, we gather the trash together. With, and on the top of the ash heap, there's an old broken violin with holes everywhere and just one string. And he cannot pass it by. His eyes are drawn to it. Well, the long story is that this guy was born a gypsy. If you know something about the gypsy people in Europe. And uh, he was illiterate. And he had only one gift, and that was to play the violin. But he was a master violinist. And he had been brought to this fame, you know, and he was known all over South Europe, playing in every concert hall. And he was looking for this violins that were worth tens, tens of thousands of US dollars. But then this old broken instrument, holes one string he could not pass it he picked it up tuned the one string how many of you know a master can play with one string and he started fiddling away with his bow got into his own little realm out there in the backyard played on this broken violin with holes and cracks and before he knew it he had a he had an audience. Everyone came out from the shop. Wow, he's playing. When he opened up his eyes, he was a little embarrassed. And he said, I want to buy this, this violin. And they were laughing at him. It's not for sale. Take it if you want it. It was going to be burned tomorrow. I love the sound, he says. And 
I love this one string. And, and I want to pay the same price as for the most expensive violin in the shop. And he refuses anything else but to pay, and he pays. And then for the remainder of his career, he refused to play any other instrument. And he never put the other three strings on it. He played on one string. On a broken violin full of holes. And everyone was saying, why is he doing this? Why is he wasting his last years of his, of his amazing career doing that? His daughter asked him on his deathbed, and this has become a legendary story in South Europe. Dad, why? He said, because when the Lord came by my ash heap, I had cracks all over. When the Lord came by me, I was about to go up in flames. But his nail-marked hands picked me off that ash heap. Tuned the one string I had and played for kings and presidents and in concert halls. And he loved the sound, the broken sound. When you're in the hands of the master, every hole in your life will make sense. And here is what I'm going to tell you. Even though he did this, that violin was a new creation in the hands of the master. When you give your life to Jesus, that doesn't mean that you will now no longer remember anything that you have done when you were in sin. You, it's not going to be like this. You will forget all your memories of all the abuse and everything you've been through. No, you will remember. But in the hands of the master, you will sound to the world. When I heard his story the first time, I was a little boy. And then when I became a believer, it came back to me. And I can tell you I am that violin. When he doesn't play, I cry. When he plays too much, I cry again. I always complain. But if he doesn't pick me up in his hands and plays and makes music I can't live I belong between his chin and chest I belong when his fingers runs over me I belong in his arms and in his hands and tonight Jesus is passing by every hash, ash heap in Griffin every ash heap in Atlanta tonight Jesus is walking through He's coming to every field, to every backyard, to every house. And he knows everything about you. And he can't pass you by. He stoops down. He picks you up. He tunes your one string. And he plays. You belong in God's orchestra. You might say, I'm wasted. I got nothing left. I'm wasted. I'm just wasted. No. Jesus is looking for broken instruments. And then he is going to build something brand new out of you that you could have never imagined. Let's stand up on our feet everywhere. I feel the Holy Spirit everywhere in this place tonight. I feel Jesus is right in this room. Lift up your faces towards heaven right now. Lift up your faces towards heaven and close your eyes. Even if you are not sharing faith with me yet, let me pray for you. Let me pray for every man and every woman, every boy, every girl, everyone that is in this room. The angels are running into the scene here. I see them in the spirit realm. And the blood of Jesus is flowing through this place like a mighty river. Lift up your faces. Close your eyes. Give everyone room to respond to Jesus right now. We are not binding anyone else by peer pressure. We are allowing everyone to be an adult. We are allowing everyone to be brave and free and make their own decisions. Jesus comes by your field where you are kicking about in your blood. Jesus comes by your ash heap where you are nothing but a broken instrument. And he can't pass by. He washes you. He wraps you. He adopts you. He picks you out of there. And he puts his hands upon you. And he plays. And he makes music with you. 
Lift up your faces. Lift up your faces. If you're in this room today and you would like the master to pick you up and you would... You would like to say to him, I need that soap of yours. I need that shampoo of yours. Make me into a new creation. Let that blood of Jesus touch my life tonight. May, oh, Jesus. Wherever you are, you're crying out in your heart. You know, we don't care what you've called yourself and what background you have or where you're coming from. Jesus is at your ash heap. Jesus is in your backyard. Jesus is in right at your blood puddle he's looking at you and he says you are going to live you will live you will not die you will live I will take you in my hands and I will make music with you I will take you in my hands and I will make something brand new out of you wherever you're standing lift up your faces towards heaven right now and close your eyes and look to Jesus because Jesus is standing here in this room tonight looking at each and every one of you with eyes just full of love tears in his eyes says come to me I will make everything new come to me I will cleanse you come to me I will be your life your healing I will fight for you wherever you're standing if you would like to pray a prayer of salvation prayer where you ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse you wherever you're standing if you have walked away from Jesus because you met with some mean so-called Christians come back to Jesus tonight he has not given you up he's giving you a second chance a third chance a seventh chance wherever you're standing lift up your head close your eyes Jesus is standing right in front of you a I really pray that you could hear Jesus tonight. Not the preacher from Africa, but Jesus. He's calling to you. He's crying out to you. And wherever you're standing now, I want you to be free. I want you to be an adult. I want you to say, I don't care about the others. I'm going to count to three. When I've counted to three, you're going to shoot up your right hand in the air if you want the blood to cleanse you. If you want the Holy Spirit to change everything in, if you, in, in your life, it's going to happen now. Jesus is no longer on that cross. He's standing here in front of you. He is in our midst. And He's walking through Griffin, walking through Atlanta. And He says, you are going to live. When I've counted to three, you're going to shoot your right hand up as a sign in the air to Jesus right in the face of the devil and you're going to shoot that hand up to Jesus but also so that I can see it so that I can pray with you and help you because tonight the blood is reaching you tonight there is new hope for you are you guys ready are you guys ready I count and then you shoot up your right hand in the air one two three Come on, hands are coming up everywhere. Hold on.